are very happy to invite Mr. Eric Cornwell. Uh, please give a warm welcome. Where do you want me to? Uh, just sit right there. Okay, here, perfect. Thank you. Oops. So, welcome, Mr. Cornwell. How are you today? I'm perfect. I mean, since I'm not Dutch, I'm not that tall, so I feel a bit small here. Yeah? I, won't, I won't stand because it won't make much of a difference, so I stay seated. I have the same problem, I think. <laughs> Can we ask you, uh, why are you at UBA today, if you just want to tell the audience? Where? Why are you at UBA today? At the university? Why or where? Why? 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 I mean, because I was invited uh, by all. Uh, I don't... Four, four or five months ago, I think, we, we, we tried to find a date. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I, I, love, I love visiting institutions. I mean, it was so frustrating to have these two years of blackout during which we couldn't meet people except through a ridiculous screen. Uh, and now, yes, I'm moving around quite a lot. And I'm delighted to be with you here in Amsterdam. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, actually, we were wondering, you visit a lot of institutions, right? So how do you think our campus compares to others? Well, I haven't looked at all the campus because uh, yesterday, as I told Rolf, um, I came earlier, so I walked for an hour and a half all, all around, and actually I saw your building, the business school, but it was further than this one, uh, so I don't exactly know the magnitude of the campus, but uh, it looks very open, very, I mean, lighty, and that's important <laughs> if you want to study, and people look very relaxed, which is very important. Yeah, I mean, I think so. It's a slow Monday, probably, for sure. We had midterms last week, so... Everybody's ah, okay. still yeah. recovering. <laughs> now I understand. <laughs> so, to begin with, I think we should reflect upon the last few extremely chaotic years. Um, businesses and, and educational institutions have had to deal with a global pandemic, um, economic upheaval, and an ever-worsening climate crisis. So, it's not looking like any of these things will be solved anytime soon. But what are three of the top priorities that uh, the EFMD and educational institutions need to focus on to be future ready? Well, I don't know if there are three, uh, let's say, uh, uh, only three, or uh, let's say, uh, directions to be taken or recommendation. I mean, for sure, uh, our institutions have followed perhaps too much of a, a linear path of reflection. Uh, if you want, um, most of the academic institutions are more constructed for, let's say, to do a very good job. I mean, they're well-oiled organizations, but they don't experiment enough. Um, um, I think this is a very critical element to be able to, uh, to be ready for anything. Um, for instance, in the past, you had uh, uh, an expression saying, oh, this guy is not very structured. He doesn't think like the other ones. Uh, he, he, he's, he's an outlier. And actually today, I mean, when you have something like the COVID-19 crisis falling on your head, you need to be able to just uh, uh, do differently. And I think it's very critical to be able to teach students that we are in a non-linear sort of world. Uh, I think in the business schools, we are not too bad at that, to tell you the truth. Uh, I know of certain other faculties that are much more traditional, but we need any way to encourage this kind of behaviors in our teaching. And we certainly need also to have a research that goes much more in this direction. Uh, today, research very often is built around a career path of professors, whereas it should be very close to the preoccupations of society. So these kind of elements, I think, are very important. But this element of improvisation that I was mentioning before is very critical. In the past, I mean, when a professor would tell you, but what you have written is improvisation, that's bad. No, today we have to improvise so many times that we should try to foster that in people's behavior. Okay, but so it sounds a bit tricky. If I'm interpreting you correctly, yeah. like you talk a bit about crisis management, being creative and flexible, right? Yes. But how would you uh, concretely uh, see that in schools, like because when you do reviews, for example. Uh, oh, in, in schools, I mean, uh, if if you, you you have you have mentioned the case of Equus that started 25 years ago, and definitely, if you compare a school that was accredited 25 or 20 years ago, I mean, with today, the same school, when you look at the self-assessment report and the progress that they have been made, that they have made, 
it's just incomparable. Mm. I think, I mean, we have, we play the role, a certain role, as a sort of catalyst for schools to help them engage in, in this kind of sort of, uh, let's say, uh, sensitive, sensitive path of thinking. Uh, but they, they did it by themselves. I mean, um, uh, when you look at the personal development of students, when you look at the way internationalization has been managed by most of the schools, um, when you look at, uh, let's say, the training of professors, mm -hmm. uh, I think the progress has been enormous. We still have a long way to go, and uh, in my speech later on, I'll talk about a, a paradigm shift that we have certainly to operate. But altogether, uh, I think the return on investment that schools are providing to society is very high, mm. and is much higher than in the United States, for instance. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it's not a racist statement, <laughs> but I mean, if you take the budget of uh, your business school, you translate it to the United States, you compare, I mean, a comparable school, don't even compare. Mm. You wouldn't have an exchange with this school, because the school would be three or four levels below yours. So what I mean is that we don't realize, I mean, how much we have built in Europe in particular mm -hmm. uh, through, um, with very few resources. Yeah. Uh, so um, it, we have a tendency to never be happy. I mean, Dutch people, French people are even worse. We are the worst in the world. <laughs> uh, so we bash ourselves all the time. But in reality, what has been built is quite admirable, I think. I don't know if I've answered your question. No, I think that that's really good. I would, I would like to, to be careful. <laughs> I would like to uh, maybe follow up then and ask that the, um, how do you then concretely like how has this been reflected in your organization for your criteria? Uh, for, for us, it's very clear. I mean, all, all the elements that I've mentioned uh, uh, were developed from the very beginning. For us, if you want, at the beginning of the models. Uh, we had two transversal criteria mm -hmm. that should irradiate in all the others. It okay. was internationalization and corporate links. I mean, internationalization is obvious, and for a country like Holland, it's even more obvious, because with all due respect, your territory is not extremely large. Yeah. <laughs> but you understood very quickly, much before countries like mine, where we still look at our own belly, uh, you perfectly understood that speaking English, being open, being able to trade, being able to understand the other culture was absolutely crucial. Yeah. And you made it. So internationalization is the first base. The second one, corporate links. I mean, how do you want a business school to be only inward oriented? Just think about doing a research on something extremely precise that has absolutely no link whatsoever with the management of organizations. Why do you want to deliver lectures that would not help you harmoniously integrate in a company? This is just crazy. So for us, these two elements were definitely uh, very critical. Since then, we have added, and you were talking about our responsibility, etc. we have added another one, transversal, that is ethics, responsibility, and sustainability. So those elements should also irradiate within uh, the organization, I mean, within the business school, so that I personally don't really believe in one lecture where you do only ethics, you see? Yeah. So imagine now you have your lecture about ethics, so uh, Angus, you're very nice, you respect everybody, uh, okay, perfect, then he goes, you know, with the aureole, and then he runs to the lecture in finance where he's going to make good money on the, you know, on the, on the financial markets or the HR the law where you're going to fight 200 people. I don't think it's right. I think what's right is to have, let's say, this kind of topics mm -hmm. spread all over the curriculum. Mm. I remember the, the, the speech, the conclusive speech of the first professor at Harvard Business School that had the chair in ethics, and he left saying, you must do ethics because ethics pay. Oh. <laughs> then you say, great, you have done all your career, in my opinion, not understanding anything. <laughs> but that's just my opinion. And, uh, yeah, that's well, quite interesting. Um, and I think we're going to talk I'm about doing ethics. my best. Huh? They're Absolutely. Very, <laughs> Absolutely. They are very exigent. Huh? I think we'll talk about ethics a little bit more later on. Okay. Um, first of all, just something really quite practical. Yeah. Um, to kind of start us off, um, I think there's been a lot of crises recently, uh, and crisis management is a big part of what you do with the EFMD. 
Um, and COVID-19 was probably the most um, obvious of the recent crises that we've had to face. Uber right now is returning back to a pretty much strictly on-campus education. Um, but there's a lot of people who think that online education uh, continues to offer a lot of benefits to students. The reception to a mostly uh, on-person campus education has definitely been mixed. What is your opinion on where we should stand? Well, that's a very interesting and a very touchy issue mm -hmm. because there are plenty of dimensions that you're touching yeah. with a question like that. Um, for me, I did a TED talk like on that subject long ago. I mean, perhaps you were not born. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, on the subject, and uh, and it was, I think it was about, I mean, from castles to networks. Yeah. I mean, we perfectly know that in universities, if you go back 400, 500, or even uh, before years ago, uh, knowledge was built within the walls of the universities and shared in the agora. Okay, mm -hmm. just like here, provided we are progressing, I hope. Yeah. Uh, and then the rest of the world were, was pretty much kept in ignorance, okay. Step-by-step uh, -step institutions have, got, have gone out of their normal, let's say, walls. I mean, through exchanges, etc., publications, and, uh, and also, more recently, the digital world. Mm. So now we have online diplomas, etc., and then, of course, what happened with the COVID. Uh, for me, those two elements are certainly, uh, uh, they, they must go hand in hand. Because uh, I'm not certain, to tell you the truth, that for a, an accounting 101 course, yeah. you need to be on campus, seated, waiting that the professor is writing the balance sheet or whatever. Yeah. I think there, there is a good part of lectures that could potentially be let's say, delivered online yeah. with very good uh, uh, self-evaluation systems. And at the same time, bringing students on campus for more refined, more sophisticated topics on which you would interact with professors on a much, with much smaller groups, where if you want the added value, where you go beyond the figure of the treasury level or the, I don't know, the the level of debts or the convertible bonds or whatever, where the professor will tell you, but you'd see behind that, you can perhaps think about this and that. And you know, this interaction, because you will never replace, let's say, the, 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 the power of interaction together with your colleagues and together with the professor. So in my opinion, that would be excellent mm -hmm. to do that because it would also, I don't know if this expression would be correct in English, but re-nobilize noble, so professors would become noble again, the, 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 what our profession, because we would concentrate on something that brings a lot of value to you, and that would, let's say, excite our brain as well, so I think it would be a win-win. Right. Whereas all these basic courses could be delivered another way. I mean, I'm sure these courses could even be shared with institutions of your network. I mean, do you, do you, I mean, if you have Spanish, uh, uh, um, British, etc., uh, um, um, let's say cooperating schools, <coughs> maybe you could have one online course for everybody. You would do economies of scale, and at the same time, professors would gain this time to do something else. Yeah. Right. And to give you, I think, a better education, a more specific way. The same with PhD programs. Come on, I mean, uh, PhD programs, they don't make you, uh, let's say, go higher in the rankings, right? I mean, you, you know the cost of a PhD program, especially you and the rector Magnetisus, I'm <laughs> sure he knows. I mean, there are plenty of elements that could be shared. And having professors concentrating on the mentoring of the student would be, in my opinion, of very high value. Right. I don't know if I've correctly answered your no, question. No, I think, I mean, For you've sure. definitely answered the question. I am wondering, though, will you look at w whether or not the university offers online or doesn't offer online education in the accreditations in the future when you're reviewing schools? Or you just don't I don't think it's, again, I yeah. mean, it's a strategic choice. I don't think our organization should interfere with the strategy of an institution. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, if the school does a wonderful job only face-to-face, -face, perfect. If the school does a magnificent job only online, then it wouldn't be an equi school because it's not really 
an institution. I mean, it's more a network. Okay, actually, that uh, brings us perfectly to the next question. We uh, didn't fit there. <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as we've understood, ECOSIS is sort of an improvement program, right? Yes. You continually review universities and work with them to make them improve. Right. So, how much influence do you guys have over universities? Well, that's, um, they are tricky, huh? <laughs> None, of course. <laughs> no, I think, you know, uh, uh, there is a book called, the, I mean, and several books called, I mean, uh, be a force for good, I mean, this kind of yeah. element. And, and to tell you the truth, perhaps I'm not succeeding all the time, and for sure I'm not succeeding, succeeding all the time, but we really try to be a force for good to push institutions to do better, mm. not to be abominable examiners or auditors, you know, giving sanctions, etc. Uh, and this has been very, very clear for EFMD, all over the history of Equus in particular. Yeah. Let me give you an anecdote. We still have time for anecdotes? Absolutely. Yeah, I hope, I hope sure. you're not bored. <laughs> if you're bored, you, you, you shout or whatever. But I remember, of course, it's prehistoric times, uh, Jurassic times. Uh, when, he, when Equis was created, you had two forms of accreditation. Mm -hmm. You could be either full accredited, meaning that you had five years, yeah. or you could be, it was called, conditionally accredited. So it was an accreditation for three years, and in the bylaws that uh, those people wrote, you could get this accreditation only twice. Mm. Mm. Only twice. So what happens after two times? A five year, hopefully. Or out. Yeah. And I remember cases where the school was basically in between recommended five years and in the accreditation board, you had people with a big voice saying, but well, too bad. But you see the, the unfairness of the yeah. process because at the same time, you've got schools coming up, yeah. deserving three years, and another one having had three years, two times, and then perhaps not really ready for five, maybe yeah. four. Mm -hmm. And then you say, sorry, bye-bye, bon voyage. <laughs> I mean, so we changed that. Yeah. We changed that. Um, the same when an institution later on would lose its accreditation, because unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes institutions do lose their accreditation. And it's catastrophic. I mean, for sure. We have now in place a deferral period. If you lose your accreditation, you have one year and you have a second chance. So that you can... You can recuperate your yeah. accreditation. You see these kind of elements we have put in place, and it's definitely in the objective yeah. of being benevolent. A yeah. force for good. Exactly. Yeah. So you said that losing an accreditation be, can be catastrophic, but I have to admit, I did not check to see whether or not Uber had an Equus accreditation before I applied. Yeah, and I actually didn't even know uh, what they were. So were we just really unprepared, or are the accreditations for somebody other than prospective students? No, I think, you know, I mean, at the beginning it was clearly B2B. Mm -hmm. When we started, accreditation was a sort of peer exercise. Uh, and and, and we, we did not, I mean, the students are involved through a student report when we do the accreditation. Mm -hmm. you, we also visit you in the classroom, we also have meetings specifically with you. But it's true, we have not oriented our action towards you uh, primarily. Right. Um, um, indirectly, you know it because if you want to get in the Financial Times ranking, you need to be accredited. If you're not accredited, you cannot be in the Financial, finan financial Times ranking, mm -hmm. and in others, you, you have points, etc. Yeah. whatever. Well, I mean, perhaps we should do more. I mean, we are, we are working for the end, not the end user, because you are not the end user. The end user is society, companies, <laughs> organizations. Because <laughs> so, you know when a student says, well, I'm the client, you're not the client. The client is society. That's, that's in my opinion, a very important distinction that we have, we have to make. Um, we, we built, uh, let's say, something with a higher head for internships and career fairs. And we started career fairs in particular during the COVID uh, uh, moments. Because there was no way for you to meet, um, uh, let's say, companies, etc., for internship or for a job. And we created a portal, and, and uh, I think, I'm sure UVA has one, uh, a higher ed portal, and you could go, and at a certain moment, there was a fair, you could meet uh, uh, companies in, uh, in different chat rooms, etc., 
And we had thousands and thousands, and dozens of thousands of students taking part, and many companies. You were very good sometimes. Companies didn't know exactly how to use the chat rooms. That, that was very funny. Uh, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> that is quite funny. Um, yeah. So you also, you early talked about the United States. Yes. And you don't operate that much in the United States. Um, but you do accredit, I think, a four or so universities. Yes. Um, one of which is the Washington University in St. Louis, which I've heard is a very good school, and it does have an Equus accreditation. Um, but let's say Harvard does not have no. an Equus accreditation. I can explain. So, yeah, can you explain? Is Washington University one of the best schools in the States? It's a good school, but it's not Harvard or Sloan, if you want. But, you know, it can't be simpler. I mean, we have many Dutch people, so you're very pragmatic, you understand very well. Uh, you remember the the group Everything But The Girl? Not you, you're too young. But yeah, yeah, I don't think actually. Too young for that one. <laughs> I'm sure. Go on Google, you will think it's good, good music. <laughs> yeah. My strategy has been Everything But The US. Ah. Shocking, yeah. Eh? <laughs> and you know, not, not shocking. Because in the United States, the very top schools, they don't give a damn about accreditation. They are not interested. They do ACSB mm -hmm. because they need it for scholarships. You need to have an external or accreditation. Right. So they basically give the accreditation to Harvard, they said, so they're happy. They are not going to proactively look for an accreditation, first of all, because they are American, yeah. Yeah. and they are the best of the best, as we all know. Um, uh, you see what I mean? And then, well, they, they, they don't care. So why do you want to invest a lot of energy and time to convince institutions that have no interest? I mean, I had personal friends who were deans mm. of top, the top five, in the top five, and I, I told them several times, and we, we had discussion, and they said, yeah, to please you, maybe we could <laughs> do it, but my faculty yeah. would not understand. And so, you know, you can bring the horse to the water, but you can't force the horse or the donkey to drink the water. So why, what for? My directors of accreditation, you know, PhDs from Harvard, from I will go and I will find a solution. They meet the schools. The schools didn't, had no interest. So for me, it was much more important to get the best business schools all over the world, but not in the US. Yeah. And if we interest the United States, we will interest them through different means. For instance, we have a tool called BSIS, Business School Impact System, mm -hmm. where we assess the impact of a business school on its ecosystem. Environmental, entrepreneurial, financial, etc., etc. This is something unique that we have. We may interest them with that. Yeah. Uh, we have we, we, we created a business school in China. Mm -hmm. Actually, in 1984, we had a European project called SEMI, China Europe Management Institute. There was no business school in China at the time. You know, it was a you know like a no man's land, no business school land. You had just the University of Chicago. Uh, Buffalo at yeah. New York, sorry, that had something at the Dalian Institute, then it disappeared. And we started that, it worked beautifully. 94, the European Commission, together with the Chinese government, said you must create a joint venture. They invested a lot of money to help us, and they created CEIBS, China Europe International Business School. This school today, executive MBA is in the top five in the world, and I think the full-time may be in the top 10, it's an enormous institution, and we still have half of it. We, we, we own, I mean, we don't get dividends, yeah. huh? don't take you wrong, but we, we have an influence on that. And this school has trained many, many Chinese managers, and we have, one way or the other, been able to influence their behavior as well. Of course, at the moment, I knock on wood, it didn't work very well, but hopefully in the future it will. So perhaps we can interest American schools with that because they cooperate. Mm -hmm. Sloan mm -hmm. cooperates with this school, Harvard cooperates with this school. So one day, when they will understand that there is something else than the United States, they may have an interest in coming to us, depending as well on the evolution of AACSB accreditation. So again, coming back to this, a force for good, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we know from the blurb here in the, your book, Mm -hmm. uh, that's EFMD, uh, European Foundation for Management Development, is a not-for-profit. Yes. Uh, so we were actually wondering, uh, where do you get your funding from? Ah, so our funding, you know, uh, I'm, 
a peasant, a French peasant, or not very, you know, farmer. And what my grandparents always told me that you shouldn't put all your eggs in the same basket. Mm -hmm. So when I came at the in the organization, we had very few sources of funding. It was mainly membership fees, conference uh, fees, and it was the beginning of Equis. When I came, I think we had 11 schools accredited. Mm -hmm. uh, so my obsession has been, because we were not in a great, in a very rosy financial situation at the moment, uh, my objective has been, together with my, uh, my colleagues, to diversify the sources. So uh, going through professional development, European projects, research, sponsoring. So I think we have 86 or 87 different mm. lines at EFMD. So I think the world is becoming very complex. So if our answer to the world is not as complex as the world, then we will not survive. So it means that you need to have a sort of point-to-point -point service to your community. And this is what we are trying to do. But I have great colleagues for that. Incredibly great. Nice. So we have been uh, looking a bit on your website. Yeah. Um, so you have to we correct us website. here if we're wrong. But if I was to uh, try to get the Ella Business and Management School accredited um, tomorrow, uh, the total cost for that accreditation would actually be around 50,750 yes. euros. Yeah, that's it. So we're wondering a bit, what is the trade-off here between spending that on accreditation or like directly to students? Well, I mean, if I'm a bit uh, direct and cruel, Go for it. I would tell you that, uh, uh, how much do you charge for an executive MBA student? I need to look that up. I think... It's, it's 45,000. Yeah. 45? Yeah. Yeah. It's almost the cost of an accreditation, one MBA student. That is true, yeah. So that's my answer. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I don't want to, I can elaborate, but you know, that's, that's not the, but uh, you, know, you know, if I want to be even more cruel sometimes, but not for the students, for our community, it was assessed by the Financial Times, sorry, by The Economist, that publishing a Nay Journal article can go up to half a million dollars for one article that most of the time doesn't revolution uh, management science. So it's 10 times the cost of accreditation. So I believe that the most important thing that you should look at when you go through accreditation, of course the label is very interesting, of course the outcomes can give you a lot. But this is first of all looking at yourself, self-assessing yourself, mobilizing people around you and looking again at the directions that you are taking, uh, trying to evaluate whether they are, they are right or not for yourself. Uh, and I think this is a very, very critical element. And, uh, and definitely, one of the very interesting, uh, let's say, outcomes of an accreditation uh, is the fact that you can partner with institutions alike. Mm -hmm. And I've had so many discussions with uh, uh, deans of business schools, newly accredited, telling me, Eric, I mean, uh, in... Uh, three months, I've been able to do what I haven't been able to do in three years. Finding partners, etc., building agreements, corporations, etc. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very well invested money. Yeah, okay, to tell so you the truth. If I start <laughs> Ella Business and Management, I will get an accreditation done. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one thing that we were on this topic as well, you mentioned it's like a little bit of drop in the ocean. But we're wondering if this is uh, the case for all universities. You're active around the world, right? So maybe the UVA is a very old institution. Yeah. Uh, they have an MBA program that is probably pretty lucrative. Um, but is this the case for all schools and all around the world? Or is there maybe a little bit of a, a threshold hardship to get like on the international stage? So you're talking now about the, 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 the financial critical mass that you need to have yeah. to, to operate internationally exactly. or the differences between institutions. Yeah. It's a very good question and it's a, it's, you have enormous disparities among institutions. Um, you have, you've got to know that for a classic business school, uh, you can consider that you have very few poaches of profitability. You can get them in executive education, you can get them in executive MBAs, uh, bachelor, you don't make money, or you start. I mean, if you have certain procedures and certain a certain strategic posture, masters you balance. PhDs, as I said, is a catastrophe. Yeah. So it's a permanent nightmare for a normal organization to balance its account. 
not even talking about the fact that we are, let's say, under pressure from for-profit uh, providers yeah. uh, or networks that are taking advantage of micro-credentials, etc. LinkedIn, you know, what they're doing, etc. So, uh, of course, it doesn't have the depth of an academic institution, but they may potentially limit some important sources of financial contribution to, to us. But, but differences are enormous. For instance, I, mean, I was mentioning France, the public universities don't have enough money to operate properly, and I think it's a shame. Yeah. Uh, you have a, 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 let's say, a sort of diplodocus, that is the secondary education, that should be reduced so that money can be invested in uh, higher education, but also in primary education. Because this, you know, this is something we always forget to talk about. Uh, ethics, etc. Great, but you know, the most important courses in ethics you can get are during the primary school. If somebody is rotten at the age of 30, I'm not sure that the course in ethics will help him get better. Whereas, if in primary education, I mean, professors, well-paid professors with a sense of mission, would have had an important uh, role in teaching that, I think we would be certainly better off today. Well, yeah. That's my opinion. I think, personally, I would agree. But actually, uh, it's funny you mentioned this uh, rotten 30-year-old. Uh, you also evaluate the student body yeah. as part of Equus, right? Sure. Uh, and again, from your website, uh, we read that uh, you ensure a high-quality student body through you're looking at the appropriate selection processes at the university. Sure. So we're wondering for this uh, student body uh, a little bit what a high quality one looks like. For example, does a high quality student body mean a diverse student body? I can't agree more. I mean, for me, the worst of the worst is to be normative. Mm -hmm. When you want to consider that a student has to pass a test and that must have a minimum level, I mean, quantitative level, whatever, I think it's wrong. I think the richness of the world is diversity, as you said. We need to have as much diversity as possible. Uh, we need to have uh, people coming, I mean, diversity also internationally, I mean, uh, cultural diversity, uh, social diversity. And to tell you the truth, well, I would believe that the, almost the least of our problem is the student body. Because the, 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 the current generations are great. I'm not saying that because you interview me, eh? but I think you, you're, you're going through so many issues, yeah. so many problems, so many uncertainty, and you have the, let's say, the, the, the willpower to, to move forward, and it's visible. And I think that the, the current generations are admirable. I think the worst generation is the baby boomer. We spoke about that together. They are abominable. <laughs> Those ones, they have known only economic growth. They have never had problems with unemployment. No um, AIDS, HIV problem. They were doing everything they wanted. They came to retirement, very high pension, and they still be believe that the world is theirs. You go in the supermarket, they push you. They say, that's me first. Uh, what are you doing? Men like women. I mean, you say, uh, uh. so I really think that our education system has not worked so badly because the current generations, I think, are, are great. As a snowflake, I uh, <laughs> appreciate that. That's really what I think, I mean, deeply. Uh, deeply. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, um, so, tuition as well, as we were looking through, I think that's a big thing that can make it difficult for a lot of students in order to get into these educational institutions. Um, and can make, uh, you know, it, it's sort of what makes or breaks diversity to some extent. Yeah. So does Equus look at the tuition rates of a university when they're considering? We look at it, but again, here yeah. you are entering, a, at the same time, a strategic element mm -hmm. of the funding of the school, or sometimes a regulatory dimension that prevents institutions from getting higher fees or whatever. An example, because here, Angus, you have taken the, the party of saying, ah, sometimes it may be too high, but sometimes maybe too low. And then you deliver nothing because it's too low. Example, mm -hmm. let me give you an example. In France, I was talking about public universities, no tuition fee. Sorry, they, they, they can't deliver proper education. If you do a strategic management course, this is my topic, in a, in a room with 500 students, it simply doesn't work. 
At the same time, it's very funny because in France, you have engineering schools, and in other countries, it's the same. And those engineering schools, when you're at the very top, like Ecole Polytechnique, you're paid. Yeah. And then you go to an application school like Mines de Paris, mining school, but it doesn't, you don't, I mean, it's the most sophisticated one. You're paid as well. You have 200 students, roughly. You know how many professors? Close to 200. Not bad as a, as a professor-student ratio. And they don't pay tuition fees? The tuition fees, I mean, they are paid themselves. You imagine the cost of a student like that. I'm sorry. So you know you have egali liberté, égalité, fraternité for France. Uh, uh, freedom, equality, and fraternity. And at the same time, in universities, they don't have a kopeck, a penny, uh, to, f you know, to deliver good education. So this is exactly the country. I mean, we need to adapt the tuition fees to the situation yeah. of uh, the families. Because what I forgot to say is that the families in these top engineering schools are all at the top of the pyramid. You see? Yeah. So basically, you finance people who don't need it at all. Whereas the people going to the normal university, they don't get anything. Bad, huh? There is a balance that you need to be able to uh, Yes, right. you need to, let's say, restructure that. Yeah. yeah. So actually, um, this is interesting. So you talked previously about uh, uh, how much it costs to get an article published in Nature, right? Uh, and you have some universities that are definitely underfunded, but a lot of the money is also going towards research, correct? So uh, we looked uh, also at your accreditation criteria of the faculty, and you do seem to value research output very highly. And we're wondering um, why you emphasize that rather than, for example, the teaching quality. Again, they go hand in hand. And again, it depends on the type of research. Uh, an academic institution, by essence, should produce knowledge. The sense, the raison d'être of an academic institution is to produce knowledge and to disseminate this knowledge. The point is that I think we have lost our way a bit yeah. by going far too much on very sophisticated and esoteric research that does, does not have necessarily an application in your lectures mm -hmm. or in the management of organizations. And this is one of the issues that we are currently facing. So it's not that we shouldn't do research, but this research should be, let's say, uh, transferred to the lectures and should be done in the interest of society. Uh, and to tell you the truth, ACSB, which is the other accredited, big accreditation in the world, we all agree on that, you know? But it's like a bit like the Sisyphus, you know? You know Sisyphus he is pushing the rock up to the the apex of the mountain, and the rock falls again, then Sisyphus goes again, and well, you see, not very funny, but this is what we have been trying to do for 20 years. Mm -hmm. but, but the academic structures are so much structured mm -hmm. around a certain way of thinking, mm -hmm. axiomatic, hypothetical deductive, von Humboldt type, von Humboldt, 1804, 1804. That, Breaking this paradigm, because it's a paradigm, is very difficult. But I think it's an imperious necessity for us. I'm not saying that nobody should publish in a journal, don't take me wrong. I'm saying that the richness comes, you, may, you, you said it, comes from diversity and from the acceptance of a much broader sort of basket of research. Um, so something you mentioned earlier is sustainability and how yep. that's become a much larger role in um, business management, management education. So I think we're wondering, um, you know, recently we've seen terms like, um, so I think we're wondering how can businesses and management education uh, deal with climate change as they're teaching students? How can they involve climate change and, and other sustainability? Well, I mean, I think influencing companies is very difficult, yeah. except through, through you, through the people who have been trained, and through actions that you will eventually undertake within those organizations. And again, I mean, the, 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 the age pyramid favors this change, because we have many, uh, let's say, generations of senior managers now retiring, and uh, more and more jobs for, for newcomers, and, and this may create a deep cultural change in, uh, in, in, let's say, in, in business. I mean, as far as business schools are concerned, I mean, 
I really think they want, they, they, most of them genuinely want to do something positive yeah. by introducing uh, uh, elements in, in, in the lectures, by doing research on this kind of dimensions, by, uh, I mean, again, if you have an opportunity since you have visited the website, maybe you visited EFMD, but you can also visit EFMD Global, yes. where we have BSIS, the Business School Impact System. And you can find very good examples of institutions that have really worked a lot yeah. on the environmental uh, dimension in particular, um, um, how they have been able to convey certain messages vis-a-vis -vis their local authorities. Or We saw that, I mean, if you look at the case of Sobi Business School, for instance, in Nova Scotia in, in Canada, mm -hmm. they were even taken as an example by the local government for yeah. what they have done for the environment. Mm -hmm. University of St. Gallen as well, they got uh, praised by their local authorities for what they have done. So, you know, it's a bit, I mean, I see a painting on the back, and uh, uh, personally, I love impressionism, for instance. And I think what we are doing, it's like, it's a bit like painting as an impressionist. You go by little touches, little touches, you don't see the, you know, the final right. painting, but step by step, you may, let's say, materialize something more positive. Okay. It takes a lot of time, but... So, um, that's one way that institutions can work towards it, right? Um, we also, we had a recently a very, we found, admirable thing happen, which is that just last month, Patagonia founder and his family. You had? Patagonia founder ah, and yes. his family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. gave away basically his company, the whole yes. company, right? Yes. The non-profit task yeah, yeah. fighting climate change. And we're wondering a little bit, you say you teach a lot about ethics, sustainability, you try to integrate it. Do you think that uh, this type of thing, where you divorce the company's profits from its leadership, uh, or from its owners should be an ideal that you hold up in business schools? Well, so if I perfectly understand your question is, is a company able to really deeply think that it has a role to play vis-a-vis -vis the environment, climate change, etc.? I right? mean, I... Is it what... It, but it, I'm trying to make sure about... Yeah, yeah that, of course. Okay, then, then I mean, that, that's very difficult. We, we did a, a research together with... A, the, um, the Academy of Business in Society, a blind research asking managers whether they were, they were doing greenwashing mm -hmm. or if they were really convinced of what they were doing. And it's true that a good portion of them were basically confessing that it was more like greenwashing. Yeah. Uh, I think it's coming from... Nobody wants to have, let's say, a general dumping area as the world. Nobody wants to have bad air to, to breathe, bad food. Nobody. I mean, perhaps some ill brains, but they are very, very limited. The problem is that uh, there are some necessities and some constraints that companies have to play with. The United States, you know, companies, many companies are owned by funds asking for a very high profitability, 10, 15 percent. I mean, this is a lot of money that you have to produce to eventually, let's say, satisfy your shareholders. Mm -hmm. On the stock markets, that's exactly the same kind of behaviors. So I think that we have certainly gone too far right. on the financial markets. I think when you look at family business, they are normally non-listed non -listed companies. They are more careful in general. So I think, I mean, and it's what I'm going to tell the faculty a bit later. Uh, Karl Marx said that the end of capitalism will come from finance. Mm. And I think if we fail one day, it will be because of that. I mean, I have the example of board members of very large companies who told me stories of, let's say, uh, uh, relocalization of production in far countries for minimum amounts of money or profit but they were pushed to do so because of this system. Yep. Yeah. And I think this is, if, if you want to reform our system and if you want to have a real impact, we need to change that. And you know, the shareholder value has been a pure catastrophe. I mean, it started in the 90s, the shareholder value, and it's been a pure catastrophe in, in human terms, in social terms, uh, in HR terms in general, climate, etc. And of course, now we discover or rediscover the, the stakeholder value. 
<laughs> Can I ask them a question? Go ahead. The father agrees? <laughs> so tell me something. Stakeholder va the stakeholder value, you know that. When was it invented? It's going to be a lot more recent than we think. Yeah, actually, That's what I'm worried about. I think it's the opposite. You think it's old? Yeah, I... Uh, don't fight. Okay. No, no. <laughs> so I think I was... Uh, I don't remember an exact century even, but I remember I was reading about it and I was surprised how long ago it was. After the Second World War, beginning oh. of the 50s. So probably okay. I guess you, right. you, <laughs> If you Google it, I'm sure you can find, for instance, the, 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 the statements of the, the president of, uh, of Standard Oil, mm -hmm. oil and gas company, saying, well, I mean, we are here, of course, to satisfy our shareholders, stockholders at the time it was called, but we need to make sure that we don't affect society, right. that our people are happy, etc. But of course, if you go even before that, I mean, you take Taylor, uh, Taylor, people say, Taylor, I mean, it's, uh, let's say, oppressing people, line, line production. Taylor has never wanted that. He was even questioned in, in, in uh, let's say, official bodies, and he said, if my method is not fully applied, I don't want, I don't want it to be applied, right. because it shouldn't be uh, oppression of people. And he said, he said even, I mean, the, 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 the productivity gain should result into a golden triangle, yes. one third for the shareholders, one third for the employees <coughs> increasing the salaries, and one third for the market decreasing the price. Uh, so you see, the, the, sh the stakeholder yeah. value, we have to get back to the past yeah. uh, instead of looking at the future to find the real dynamics that we need today. And, and let's look into those dynamics, especially with employees. I think recently we've all heard terms like the quiet quitting, the great uh, renegotiation, and the yes. great um, resignation. Yes. Um, and I think, in it's particular, us. millennials and Gen Z like us yes. are becoming disillusioned by this race to the top, rise and grind work mentality. Yeah. So, um, do you think that business and management education shares in the responsibility for creating this workplace that we young people just don't want to take a part of? Well, I think that business schools have certainly opened your eyes on a number of dimensions. Yeah. And if you don't aspect, if you don't accept the rubbish that is sometimes, sorry for my expression, yeah. proposed to you, it's because you are able to think independently. Right. You're not sheep, let's say, going in the same direction. So in this context, I think it's pretty positive. Uh, but uh, we have seen this movement of great resignation, etc. It happened also in the past, you know, when people went back to the the, the, the farms, you know, um, breeding sheep, etc. They didn't end up necessarily all very well. But I think what what matters is that this new generation changes institutions by the inside, and it's very much needed. I mean, that's yeah. really what I think. Okay. We're just going to very quickly do five minutes of audience questions. Is there anybody out there with an urgent question? Um, all right, we'll go with you, sir. Do we have, yeah, Tim yeah, is we're just coming grabbing the mic. over here. Maybe you guys can pass it along. Otherwise, I can come. Look, I can. No. I think it should be. I can come. Oh, it's, I it think it's working. Perfect. Oh, got it. All Thanks. set. Thank you. <laughs> is it working? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, so I had several questions. The first one. Is, Let's just stick with one question, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, sure. Um, about. Uh, okay, then I have to think which one. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, then let's stick with. So. Um, we talked about online education, right? And there are some groups that have to follow online education because, uh, because of specific disabilities and they cannot deal uh, with large crowds in, for example, uh, lecture halls. And that leads to my question, um, does accessibility in general as part of diversity, is it being looked at when giving universities accreditations? And if so, how much is it looked at? Is it part of ethics or is like accessibility not considered at all? Thank you, it's a very good question. And I, I think it's not even ethics, I mean, it's just humanity <laughs> to be able to accept everybody. Uh, of course, we look at that, we can, we can certainly do more. And again, when I was talking about this sort of distribution of knowledge with the basic knowledge and concentration on site, 
so that professors can take care of students in smaller groups in a better manner, in a more qualitative manner, it's exactly what I mean. Um, and, 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 and I could even go further than that, saying I don't think that when you're a professor, your responsibility is over when the lecture of 30 hours is finished, saying thank you very much, dear, dear guys, good luck now, you don't exist anymore. Uh, you send me an email, I trash it immediately. I think it's, it's not, at least it's not my vision. I mean, I have students, I, I was a faculty at HEC in Paris, and after 15 years I still have students sending me messages to ask for my opinion. Maybe it's a bad opinion, I don't know. But I still have some who sort of kind of trust me, or organizing a dinner of a promotion, then going. And I think this is what we should be. I mean, the service that we render to students at a certain moment is great, but what I call the after sale is also very important. Right. Because sometimes, you know how difficult it is to orient yourself in secondary education. Where should I go? What should I study, etc., etc. But sometimes you may have the same sort of crossroads or question marks later on. And having sounding board people to help you decide is also very good. So for me, uh, let's say we always talk about uh, lifelong learning, etc. Okay, but this dimension of advising students, participants after their period of education is also important. Okay, and we'll do one more question. You up front. Hi, I, I was wondering how is the market with these, let's say, accreditation, accreditation giving companies? Uh, because the way I see it, there cannot be m more of them, so if it resembles more of a monopolistic kind, and how does one accreditation giving uh, firm or organization get the status to actually give out these accreditations and how it works and who is the one giving them the, the uh, space and the thumbs up that this one is good? Yeah. That, that's a very good question, thank you very much. Actually, first of all, we are not companies, we are not for profit, so uh, we don't have dividends that we distribute or whatever. It's, uh, I mean, we are sort of federations. So first of all, we are peers. Uh, and those peers are taking place, are, are taking part in the process. So what do we have? We have accreditation committees where we invite diverse people, deans, people from companies, etc to discuss the criteria, to see whether we are, let's say, still in line with what's going on, trying also to have a, a reconnaissance role on what's coming so that we can, for instance, I don't know, offshore campuses, online education, etc., etc., dual diplomas. So how do we apprehend them and how do we assess them, if you want? At the same time, we have an accreditation board that is, let's say, the, the body at the end that formally awards the accreditation, and we have, of course, very experienced teams of people, mostly former deans, constituting our permanent team, if you want. So imagine that you want to be accredited, you come to us, and the first thing we do is we allocate a mentor to you, an advisor, who is a former dean or, a, or an active dean, who is going to look at what you're doing and give you advice on how you can, let's say, present your case, etc., prepare the paper, and also assess whether you're ready or not. After a period that can be from three months to a year or two years, then you formally present your case for eligibility. So if you are eligible, you enter a process during which you do a self-assessment report. So this is the moment where you question yourself. I mean, you interact with all your colleagues within the organization and also its ecosystem, students, partners, etc., to prepare a report, a self-assessment report that is going to be given to the peer review team. Because we then, uh, um, let's say, appoint a peer review team, and we, we, don't call it, we don't call it an auditor team, a peer review team, where you have three deans, and you have normally also somebody from a company or in a senior position. They come for three days and they discuss with everybody, they assess the case, then they produce a report that goes to the accreditation board that makes the final decision. So you see, this is a very sophisticated process, peer-based, 
community-based, and this makes its legitimacy in particular. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you to both of our audience questions. I think we have one last question. Yeah. Um, so we know that uh, you have been teaching yourself. You're a professor, right? Uh, and we could even say now you're kind of teaching professors. Uh, <laughs> so you worked uh, for a long time with helping universities kind of achieve their full potential. Yes. Uh, and what's been your favorite part of this? What's your favorite part of your job? Well, I like that pretty much, to tell you the truth. <laughs> uh, you know, a very funny anecdote. Between now and uh, mid-December, I have 12 speeches mm -hmm. in different parts. Because, you know, during the COVID, it was... And then now people ask me to come, and it's, it's a pleasure. The, the point is, what matters in your life, and I, I'm really saying that when... I mean, if you can find a job that you love, and when you are so happy to do it, you never work in your life, not a minute. And, and that's the best. So for me, I like this kind of interaction. It was abominable to be blocked for, for two years. Uh, well, I like also international development. We are trying to build a university in Vietnam at the moment. And I think that's also very positive. What I don't like is very long meetings, you know, where basically you end up. So you need to find good neighbors to have a bit of fun, you know, passing papers, but I'm sure you know how to do it as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you. I think this has gone on long enough, but we've had a wonderful time. Thank with you, you today, very Mr. much. Cornwall. Thank you for listening, and good luck to everybody. Yeah, thank you. Best of luck on the rest of your time in Amsterdam. Thank you and very much. And to our audience as well, thank you so much for coming to thank Room you. for Discussion. Um, you can check out other interviews of ours, either on Spotify, on our Apple Podcasts, or on YouTube. Um, we also have a few upcoming interviews. You can check our Facebook for them. Um, on the 17th of October, we have Mansour Adafia, or Adafi, who is a, um, a former Guantanamo Bay prisoner. There will be a hybrid interview, so he will be calling in from Serbia, where he is currently. Um, and then on November 1st, we will invite Cecilia Vigas, who is the uh, Dutch ambassador to Afghanistan. So some absolutely fascinating stories, um, and that will also be at 1 p.m. on the stage. So I hope to see at least most of you, if not all of you, then.